Great. So in order to give some context of where Spark fits uh, when you're doing data analysis in R, um, it's, it makes sense to ask this question, right? Like, if you have slow code, what do you do? And, you know, like, it could be slow code because you're dealing with a lot of data. It could also be slow for other reasons, right? Um, so the answer is definitely not Spark, at least not, not as an entry point. Um, you know, one of the techniques that you can use is just sample data, right? Like, if you have a lot of data, you can reduce the amount of data that you have. And, you know, as long as you do it properly and, you know, you, use, you can use techniques like a statistical sampling or why not, reduce the amount of data that you have and uh, that definitely is progress in the right direction. Um, another technique that you can use when you have slow code is um, in the same way that uh, Yo Cheng was presenting uh, in the keynote this morning, uh, you can use profbis, right? So if something is slow, you can look at why is it slow. Um, it might be the case that it's your code or it's a package. You might have to use the package in a different way or you might have to uh, change to use a different package, right? Uh, but definitely uh, profbis is a great tool and um, you, should, you should use it when you, when you hit this uh, problem. And the next one is scaling up, right? Uh, so the next solution is you get bigger machines, which uh, Joe presented and also um, Darby on our, on our previous session mentioned. One great, great way of scaling up is by saying, hey, if I have a bigger machine somewhere, uh, now you can use our Studio Pro uh, job launcher to run that particular instance on a machine with more resources. Uh, for me personally, I worked last year on a, on a package called CloudML. And it was intended to take your, uh, your deep learning model, package it up, and send it to Google Cloud, train it, and then get the results. Uh, what I've seen on the GitHub issues is that a lot of people are actually using these not for deep learning, but just in general for modeling, which is totally fine. Like, you don't need to uh, use it for deep learning if you don't want to. Uh, and in general, there's multiple ways of, of scaling up. Uh, this talk is about scaling out, which means if if you're scaling up and you know, you've hit like a ceiling on the compute power that you, uh, that you have access to, or if you simply have a lot of machines spared to use, uh, what can you do to take advantage of all, all those machines? And that's where Spark fits in. Um, now, this, this slide is not uh, you know, fully comprehensive. There's many, more, many other ways of scaling up and scaling out, but at least sets the context of how, how you would usually scale, scale out. And uh, for those of you that prefer diagrams, uh, this is how it, how it looks like, right? Um, you can scale up or scale vertically, or you can scale out or horizontally, basically by adding machines. Um, it does mean that you need to install um, Spark on each machine on this cluster, uh, but once you have Spark running on each machine, you can basically run, in this case, a linear regression across all the machines without having to manually run um, you know, a subset of the data and then figure out how to aggregate it. So how do, how do you use R with Spark? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Sparkly R is an R package. Uh, you need to install it from CRAN. And the second step is you need to install Spark on that particular machine. Uh, you, run, you install it just by running Spark install. Pretty straightforward. And then you connect by saying um, Spark connect master equals local. Um, with, with Sparkly R, you can very easily work locally by specifying the parameter master equals local, but you can also run on a, a variety of cluster providers like Databricks, IBM, Microsoft, and Google, or on-premise like Cloudera and MapR and et cetera. So uh, definitely, you know, it's the same interface. Uh, you, you work with it locally pretty easily, and then you can change this parameter and connect to a proper cluster when needed. Um, one of the design philosophies that we follow in Sparkly R was to be as friendly to the R community as possible. So we try not to reinvent the wheel. So if you already know how to use Deplier, you can use Deplier um, with um, Sparkly R. If you want to use uh, SQL with the DBI package, you can also as well uh, just run a DB uh, get query and uh, get data out of Spark in, in, in parallel with the ease of use of, of R. Not only that, but you can also do modeling. And we have a, um, a beyond like uh, 50 uh, feature transformers and modeling tools available in Spark, and um, you can access them uh, from Sparkly R with ease. Um, one of the features that we worked on uh, last year was introducing pipelines, which uh, Kevin Kuo presented last year. And um, pipelines allow you to take those uh, workflows that um, you have already completed on your, on your modeling step and allows you to um, export them to production. What's new in Spark? Um, we covered streaming. Um, last year we worked on MLib, which basically allows you to take a pipeline and export it out of Spark and put it into uh, any Java compatible environment that runs the JVM. Uh, we added support for Kubernetes and a little bit of R Studio 1.2 integration. Um, so you have uh, some of the great features of R Studio 1.2 are also uh, available um, when using Spark, like you can write a custom query, SQL query, 
uh, or you can use the uh, jobs pane just to track your Spark jobs and then reopen the job uh, on Spark. Um, what are we currently working on? We're ma mainly working on two, two big features. Uh, one is support for Apache Arrow, and the other one is uh, XGBoost on Spark. So um, what is Apache Arrow? Uh, well, um, Wes did a very uh, much better job explaining this this morning. Um, but you know, uh, the one-liner is Arrow is a cross-language developed platform for, uh, for in-memory data. Uh, really, the only thing that matters to you, uh, in, I think in an ideal world, like you don't even need to know what Arrow is. Uh, we just want to make things faster for you. And uh, that's exactly what, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish. So you, you should be able to include the library, Arrow, and then Sparkly R, and get performance improvements. So let's, let's take a quick look at to see how that looks like. Um, let's see, where is this? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start another Spark instance. And uh, so this is connecting again locally. And then we're, we're simply going to go and process 10,000 records. That's not that much. Usually the first time takes a little bit longer because Spark is warming up. Uh, but it's just 10,000 rows, which is not that much. This, this computer only has two cores and uh, I think eight gigabytes of RAM, so nothing, nothing fancy at all. So we're processing uh, this data set. And you know, it just takes uh, nine seconds. And next time, it should take a little bit. Uh, it should be a little bit faster. Uh, but what is crazy is that once, once you run this with Arrow, which is not on CRAN yet, it's being under develop, uh, on, on their active development, and uh, once you run it with Arrow, we're processing one million rows, so just not 10,000, 100 times more data, and it's, we're doing that on four seconds. So that is, that is just, I, I don't even understand how, how this can be possible, but it's just, it's just great. Um, so really hoping that you don't, you don't have to worry much about Arrow, but at least while using Sparkly R, that you're gonna get these performance improvements. And uh, the other feature that we're working on is um, XGBoost on Spark, so you're gonna be able to train XGBoost models on Spark, and this is exactly what we're doing here. Um, it's basically training, um, it's an extension that Kevin Koo is working on, and you know, it trains basically a, a model using XGBoost. And uh, what is great about this is that uh, the next talk, we're gonna introduce MLflow, which is relevant to this case, because I'm basically leaving uh, a model for Kevin to decide if he wants to use it on his talk, and uh, he's gonna teach you how to, how to share models in a, in a big data science team. Uh, find back my presentation. All right, so we covered those two, and with that, I just want to say thank you and leave you with some resources. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Javier. So, we, we do have time for a couple questions, um, if anybody has some. I'm going to stand on the right side of the room here. So I have a question about uh, Arrow. That that seemed really cool. You just load the library. That you don't have to like call and call and call that library. It, yep. Spark will Sparkly R will automatically like look for yeah. Arrow being installed. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, in general, um, I don't know if you know. I'm not the expert in Arrow, but like the way the way I see it is, uh, Arrow is like a technology that provides you know support for developers. Yeah. So you know, like the fact that I'm using Arrow should be mostly transparent to you. Um, but you know, yeah, to you, like you shouldn't change anything. And in fact, we also get. We're looking forward to Arrow because uh, it should also give us some f free features. Um, currently, Sparkly R doesn't support nested data. You know, um, there is some restrictions around that. So uh, by having a cross uh, platform that can enable multiple technologies, like features like uh, nested data, should 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 become a free feature that we get on Sparkly R just by using Arrow, which is which is great. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, you demonstrated in the, right here, you demonstrated the, uh, uh, the Spark tasks as real time you called on demand in R and it worked and then it, it stopped. You know, it just, it ran and then it stopped. Uh, do you have the capability to do the process, push the tasking straight to Spark and then return to the console where you can then use the result from that, you know, in a kind of like multi node Spark topology? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I follow the question. Maybe okay. Well, so you've got one. You're pulling from one topic. You do something to it. Then you, maybe you push it back into another topic, and then you do something else. Another task is pulling from that topic. Uh, it seems like everything you're doing there is is pulling from a Spark topic or Kafka topic, and then doing stuff locally. Uh, are oh. you pushing tasks to Spark so that Spark yeah. continues to do that task while you're doing other things? Right, like that's that's the whole point of this. Um, yeah. So um, on, especially on the Shiny app, like the Shiny app actually takes this, the raw stream 
uh, which, you know, if you're using a cluster, you basically have like multiple machines uh, pulling from Kafka, and this, the, the stream is actually processed in parallel. Um, you know, like when you do the aggregations and when you do the filtering, that's actually happening in the cluster. And you, you are the one that, choose, that chooses what data either gets collected to the driver node, which we, you obviously don't want to collect a lot of data, but also you, you have the option of just pushing back to some other stream. So you can, you know, connect it back to uh, a Kafka queue for output, or you can put it on a dashboard. And, and definitely you need to be careful which data you end up collecting, but there is no restriction as to how much data you process as long as the destination can handle that much data, right? So that's, yeah. All right.